Uh, hello guys, thanks for coming back and tuning me, whether you're watching it or listening to the audio, um, Regan's Rugby Strength and Conditioning. I've got another guest for you this week. Uh, he's a guy that I'm quite good friends with at the moment. I've competed against him in Strongman. He's an international strongman. He's actually got the world's strongest man um, in our weight category. I know he's a coach or he does a bit more, more online training. He's got his own gym in Southampton. Um, and he's a new dad as well, so we'll find out what's the, what's the biggest success. Uh, Tom, how are you doing, mate? I'm good. How are you? How are you? Don't I'm ask good, me that in case my wife hears me. Okay, good. We've, uh, <laughs> we've tried to arrange this twice, and there's been, I think his wife's literally been in labour last week, right? Yeah, last time we, we organised it, she was in labour. She was about six hours in, and I was like, oh, I need to cancel, Regan. Sorry, mate. I tried She's going to be claw, screaming in the background. I tried to claw him in, but... The baby was born, which is which is fair enough. And apparently she's she's sleeping well, which is a, a parent's dream. She is. We've had a good five or six nights where she sleeps around between eight and two, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for a newborn, a good six hours in a row is quite good. We actually we actually need to wake her up and force feed her a little bit. She needs to feed a bit more frequently. Let's make those games. Let's go make those games. Yeah, been up to a game. Um, there you go. Cool. So, so, so tell, if people don't know who you are, tell them kind of a bit about your story, how, how you got to where you are now. I mentioned the sure. strong man, I mentioned the gym. Um, just give them a little recap. And sure, so my name's Tom Tom I You're allowed to show off, I want you to show off. <laughs> right, so I, I studied at university, I studied a sports science degree at University of Southampton. And then I pretty much never left. I went into personal training immediately. I didn't even go to my graduation. I had a job interview and went straight into a self-employed role at an LA fitness. Um, I was at that gym for two years, but I just kind of found it inadequate to be able to train people properly. Um, it's a small gym. It doesn't have a lot of free weights. People get in your way. It just wasn't optimal. So I took it upon myself to then start my own gym uh, within Southampton. So that was after two years and that gym is still going. It's going to be 10 years old is in it? Wow. Oh, six months or so. In a long time. <laughs> I think I came to the gym's, that gym's called Winning Health there. Solutions in Southampton. Mm -hmm. um, it's a private facility. It's all strength and conditioning based. I have every toy known to man uh, with regards to, to, to weight training. I love, I love collecting equipment. Uh, I love using new gadgets and bits and pieces. Um, as an aside for that, over the years, I've, I've had the odd request, or I started to get the odd request for um, mentorships and people asking for me, coaches asking for advice. So from that, what's born out of that is another business called Winning Performance, which is, where, which is my platform for where I educate personal trainers and strength coaches. And there's, I think, over 70 articles and loaded videos and, and cool stuff on there. Um, my hobby is Strongman. Um, as Regan said, I compete against him for how many years do we compete against you? A couple of years, three years or so? Two ish, probably. probably. Maybe two, two years because you were training under my very good friend and the guy who got me into strongman, Aaron McGoyan, who is, if you guys need to look him up, he is a phenomenal strength coach as well. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, so, yeah, I've been doing strongman for eight years. Um, I'm a three time England strongest man at under 90, must say that. Mm -hmm. um, at Worlds, my best positioning was in the, the first one in 2016, where I came second. And then more recently, um, literally on the due date of my baby, um, I was able to hit the log clean and press world record, which is 166 kilos at under 90 kilos body weight. Luckily, my wife's waters did not break, although it seemed pretty close. She was about as excited as I was after hitting that. <laughs> She's watching, right? She was. She was there. Family were there. We had a few friends there. Look um, It was fun. It was a good day. It was a good day. Like Aram, Aram unfortunately tore his quad just before. He did. He did really well just to get to around ninety-five percent, um, and then the, the quad re-popped off. Um, but it was a fun day with a few ups and downs. I, I even I even missed one of my warm-up weights. Then I missed my first attempt, and then came really? back and managed to get it. Yeah, <laughs> managed to get it. I planned on opening on the world record just so I had three attempts at it. I wanted three attempts at it no matter what, and I got it on the second attempt, which was, you know, just about all right. <laughs> open now, what did you miss? I missed 166. Oh, you opened on the world record, sorry. You did do that. I literally opened on it. I was like, 166, open on that. Okay, didn't get it. Come straight back to it, and uh, got it on the second one. And then I was done. Nice. That was it. <laughs> and then, uh, this, is for, this is for my knowledge as well. You, you went to World Strongest Man, was it once, or you've been a few times? I've been twice. The first, the first time they've ever done it um, was in North Carolina. 
and I came second to a guy called Terry Rady. Uh, he ran away with the competition. Both Rob Ward and I were kind of up there. We were on the podium, but it's a case of if you make a big mistake, you're going to drop. You're not going to be able to win the big one. Terry was very consistent and very good without. Then I returned the following year. Um, I was actually in the best shape of my life, but unfortunately, my mother passed away um, the day before I had to travel out, um, which kind of knocked me, my mental state. I ended up finishing seventh, which, you know, if you look back, your mother passing a day before, it's not that bad, um, but um, wasn't really happy. I kind of ignore that. that. That year didn't really happen for me. <laughs> cool. So then second is the record you've had so far then? Second second's my best. I don't intend on going back down. I say that. I don't intend. Because um, I said that about the log, but um, I'm, I'm pretty much done with that now. With strong men, I, I was, I was going to ask you: Is it something you're still looking forward to? Now you're kind of settling down with the Jasmine in the in the picture. Well, just training the log tends to be quite fun, and it keeps me entertained and keeps me out of trouble. So what I've done, my next goal is to try and hold the under 105 log world record, which currently stands at 186 and a half, something like that. So I need 187 or more. Oh. Um, so I've got to find, if you look at it, I, I could probably gain 20, 25 kilos of mass myself if I wanted to. And then it's only another 20 kilos on the log. So how long, how long would that take? I don't know. It's a, it's a long-term project. Someone will probably extend it by then. And so I probably need 190 uh, or more. Um, so I'm going to Lithuania with Aaron in September, um, where I hope to... <laughs> He's going to try and break the under 80 world record again, which I fully think he's going to get this time because um, his quarter will be better. But um, I'm going to go for the British under 105 record, which currently stands at 172 and a half. So if I put on a good 10 kilos of body weight, I think some extra kilos on the log should be there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, talk, talking about food there, trying to chuck on 10 kilos, is that uh, a calculated thing? Because I know some guys who might try to put on weight, will, will, that, that gives them the all access to pizza and ice cream and shit is that yeah. your go-to or are you obviously more calculated <laughs> no no uh the main thing the main the main people the main problem people have with gaining weight is they're too fat if you're too fat you're insulin resistant or if you look at it uh, along the continuum you've got insulin resistance and you've got insulin sensitivity the, the leaner person is more insulin sensitive if you're more insulin sensitive you can use insulin as a hormone to shuttle uh sugars and amino acids into the cell that's hypertrophy. That's gaining muscle mass. So the problem people have is they, they get too fat. What is too fat to gain muscle mass? Well, if you start, if you can't see your abs, you're too fat. So the people I've, I've literally jumped from under 90. I weighed myself this week. I'm 100.4 kilos in three or four weeks because I was that insulin sensitive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for me, it's a step process. Um, for me, it's a case of you can't just go, you can't just go crazy with calories for four weeks. I don't see the point in that. I think you should be a little bit more, more, more careful for me the what the system I use is mini diets. So you would do however many weeks and it's different for everyone. And you have to play with this. So for me, it was two weeks, eat, eat more. Okay. And I'm not going pizzas and stuff like that. I'm talking meat, veg, but more complex carbohydrates, potatoes, uh, rice and things like that for two weeks, eat as much as I can, a lot more. And then one week, dial that back where I would just kind of go meat, veg, maybe just one complex carbohydrate meal post workout. So my sugar intake would be lower. Uh, my workout sugar intake would also be lower. I'd reduce the carbs post workout in the shake and intra workout. But for me, it's a case of if you get too fat, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. You're going to push all of your, all of your sugars into your adipose tissue, your fat tissue. If you want to get bigger fat wise, fine, but you can't flex fat. Fat's not really linked to performance. Apart from in like open weight categories, maybe a rugby forward, it could be of use because they've got more weight, more cushioning, more shock absorption. But when we look at it uh, for performance, it actually decreases performance uh, mm -hmm. with most, most factors. Um, and that, would that be the same for who's not forward? Maybe some of the younger guys listening trying to put on that their initial few pounds yeah. like getting into adult rugby for sure the same thing same thing you know what when that are we talking like uh anywhere between what 14 and 18 year olds there uh it's just it's that's not the main listeners but if they're listening that's what i was talking about yeah if they're listening that age group can do well off this one protocol and it's on my website it's called the 150 percent calorie day i initially learned it from charles poliquin if you don't know who charles poliquin is look up strength sensei He's a, he's a big mentor of mine. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, very recently last year, but I get a lot of my stuff from him, or at least that's where I started. And then I 
and I've branched out. So if you want to learn more about strength and conditioning, Charles Poliquin is a, is a force to be reckoned with in, in the strength world. Um, but the 150% calorie day is exactly that. You train one day a week where you're trying to take in 150% of your calories. So if you're at, be at, what is it? The BMR is maybe two, 2,000 calories you need to take in an extra 50% on top of that. Makes sense? So 3,000 calories. The best way to do that is to alternate solid meals with liquid meals. So meal one would be like meat and nut breakfast. Meal two, have a shake. Meal three, have your meat, veg, complex carbs. Shake, so on and so forth through the day. Because mm-hmm. you just can't, you can't digest. That's another problem with, with people with gaining weight. They can't, you are what you absorb and assimilate. You are what you break down and people just cannot break down that amount of food. It's, it can be a job trying to eat six meals and trying to gain weight. <laughs> um, so taking digestive enzymes, but the 150% calorie day is good because uh, liquid, liquid uh, meals are going to empty from your GI tract a lot quicker. That's why they're designed like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so alternating shakes with solid meals one day a week. Do that for a month and I guarantee your body weight will start to shoot up. That is really good for anyone in between you know, 13 and 18 and they're insulin sensitive. So if, if you're, if you're already quite big, it's not going to necessarily be good for you, but those guys who are kind of <laughs> a little bit skinnier and trying to put on muscle mass, that's good for them. Uh, and how come it's just one day a week? Is there a reason behind that? Or just cause it's too much? Yeah, you can't do it too often. It's not, a, you can't do it every day, but the point is it's a shock to the system. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also, is you need to be inside probably most of the day. Your goal for that cooking, day is cooking, is, or is, is cooking and eating. Your goal isn't going out and, I don't know if that age group's at school or college. Your goal is do it on a Saturday or a Sunday, eat. Mm-hmm. Cool. And, and then with, uh, with diet side, obviously most of the guys listening, rugby players, they're having a beer at the weekend. Um, oh. A few guys I've speaking to, they just say, obviously if you're getting super mega shit-faced, your recovery is fucked for a few days. Um, mm-hmm. But as long as you calculate that into your weekly calories, it's okay to have a few, even it helps with, um, team cohesion and stuff like that. What, what are your thoughts on that? The, I mean, the, if it helps the, with team, <laughs> team cohesion is one thing, but helping performance, they, the, the, the research is getting clearer now, and I agree with it, that zero amount of alcohol is good for the human, the mm-hmm. human body. It's zero. Not like, oh, you're allowed one glass of wine. It, it's now zero. Um, so for someone to say, oh, it's good for my calorie intake, like the calories and alcohol, it, at first, Everybody, I don't fucking count useless. calories. I hate calorie counting. You go on my website, you'll see countless transformations, uh, mine included. I've never counted a calorie in my life for me or my clients. I don't do things like that. Calorie and alcohol is metabolized completely differently uh, to everything else. So adding it into calorie intake is retarded. Um, It literally doesn't make any sense. Um, If we're going to, if we're going to go, look, you have to go out and have a beer and that's, that's part of the team cohesion. That's part of the lifestyle. Cool. Um, I would come away from beer. Beer has gluten in it. Gluten is, uh, has an effect, not just on your gut for most people, but on your nervous system. Um, so I, I would stay clear of that and I would go towards maybe a cider or something. And cider has more calories in it if you're looking for calories. Uh, so what, what, would you check anything or is it just more macronutrient-wise? For, for you? Tra- <laughs> Humans are creatures of habit. So I will give them something to do. Like let's say we're starting out. I go, look, this is what I want you to change and I don't look at a don't look at a volume. Just change it to this. Generally speaking, I'm trying to clear up all the crap in their diet first. Calorie mm-hmm. counting. Obviously, calories are part of the equation, but they're not the whole equation. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe that anybody wants to long term count calories. That's why I don't do it. It's more like, isn't it? Exactly. I would rather have somebody be uh, have an intuitive way of going looking at a plate. You got is that a dog or a cat? A cat, a cat, big cat. <laughs> Brilliant. I would rather someone would be yeah. able to look at there she is, look at a plate cat. and be able to go look. This 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 has this this much meat, which is protein. This has vegetables. They're my fibrous carbohydrates. This has some rice. These are my complex carbs. I don't want people to have to weigh shit. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't track anything. Generally, we're creatures of habit. They're going to eat the same amount all the time. So what I tend to do is I manipulate certain days. Sometimes I'll give an amount. I'll go, look, you, you can only have this many, uh, this much with regards to uh, fibrous carbohydrates on non-training days. Then we'll see if that works and we manipulate things that way. So you could look at it and say, I probably look more at macronutrients than calories. Uh-huh. Make sure they're getting the right stuff in. And then so would you, yeah. would you agree with like the plate proportion method rather than giving them a third, 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 or whatever your split would be? That's easier for yeah. most yeah, that's a, that's a good way of doing it. So 
what, 40% is meat and then 30, 30 carbs and fats. Yeah. I can get down with that. Cool. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, so, so chatting about your uh, very well-renowned strength and conditioning coach, have you done any stuff specifically with rugby teams or players? And I know you do a lot of online stuff with strongmen. Is there, is there many kind of rugby players? We've got a lot of strongmen, but um, with regards to rugby where I'm based, we've had a few players, but they're more rec players. So they don't, they're, they're like you just said, they're, they're more about the social element of rugby rather mm -hmm. than the performance element. Um, but they get they get trained the same way, so I, I am familiar with 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 training rugby players. Mm -hmm. um, what are just guys, local guys from Science, and then they come into the gym. Basically, if you you get the few, you get the odd local guy come in that wants to improve performance, but nothing, nothing out of this world serious. I mean, I have a, I have one guy. He was he was playing for Scottish youth. Uh, he he's now a pro golfer. Oh really? So yeah, he's completely changed, changed. He's completely changed his career path. Um, and then we. I was friends with a guy and trained him briefly. He was, he trained with England youth to a, to a decent level, but I fell out of love with it. Um, and then, so now we're recording this season, son, that kind of just finished. What would be uh -huh. your kind of insights to give a rugby player? Um, they've probably got about four months off from now. Uh, four months off. About, about that. Yeah. Anything sure. specific that you would kind of give over the next kind of summer? Off yeah, season? I would, I would, for the first step is like month one, you need to get lean again. If you've put on excess body fat, so look at your body composition, looking at that insulin sensitivity thing, like you need to set yourself up to put on muscle mass to then get to the season heavier and stronger. Mm -hmm. um, if that's what, if that's one of your goals, if that's what, uh, a goal for the forward, for instance. Um, otherwise it would be a case of drop all your um, technical work. I don't believe you should be playing too much rugby in the off season. Mm -hmm. You should be looking at your weaknesses and going to your coach, be like, what, what was my weakness? Was my weakness the first zero to 10 meters or was my weakness, my work capacity and the, the endurance uh, through a whole game. So figure out what your weaknesses are and then train accordingly. Um, most people could do a block of getting leaner, but also working on their eccentric strength. There's an article on my website that gives you, it gives you a whole, I think a year's worth or more uh, training for that. If you improve your eccentric, it can have a huge effect on, on power output uh, come the season. And that's where a lot of people uh, are lacking. Um, so I would be looking to train four times a week. I would definitely be using methods like contrast methods. Are you familiar with this? I'm not familiar with that. I was just like, oh. so it's like a power method. So the, the, it's an easy way of uh, easy way of training. Again, it's on a um, on another article, modified strongman protocols. You'll see it on there. So it's a way of improving pat strength and power output. So what you do is you would take a big compound lift like a front squat, and you would do three reps in it at a controlled tempo usually. Um, there's different ways of doing it, but we'll go with the control tempo, five seconds down, back up. Okay. And you move straight into, so you've got to get within 10 seconds straight into uh, an explosive movement mm -hmm. or a modified strongman movement for rugby. You could, you could periodize the strongman movement. So going three front squats into three to six tire flips could, could be a great uh, indicator for performance or improved performance. Uh, yeah, I, I use, I don't, is that something you know, or you, you created or you found it from somewhere? Contrast method? Yeah. I wish I could say I created it. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I created shit. No, I mean, I was first pointed, at, pointed uh, to that from Charles. I've seen uh, various writers from Zatsirovsky, uh, Science and Practice of Strength Training, and uh, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, but Verkashansky is, is how you read it. Um, he's the, the guy or the granddaddy of plyometrics. He's a, he's a good, good author on that. Cool, because in the... Uh, in the current preseason program we've got there's a few strength super seven power exercises so now i've got something to call it and i'm gonna yeah find that, find there you out, go find out how you say that guy's name and i'm gonna quote that every time and sound really smart it would you would probably if you've got four months those would be the the, the last four to eight weeks is where you'd probably place those mm -hmm. um month one is iron out all the injuries and imbalances that have happened over the season so are you quad dominant are you glute dominant uh, do you have a weakness in your external rotators, your lower trap? Iron out all that in month one alongside getting lean. And it sucks because you have to do it straight away. And then you can start building maybe eccentric strength and then power, power, and then you'll peak for the season. Awesome. And then talking about kind of injuries then, in season, obviously you've had your experience as well. Um, what, what would be the best way of kind of combating injuries? Is it maybe chucking, I spoke to a few physios on here before, chucking some prehab a whole workout in or one or two exercises before you train what would be your best advice on those 
and your experience if you've got any good stories. My best advice is to look at structural balance indicators first. Again, it's another thing I got from Charles, and you can have structural balance indicators uh, for any sport. But if you look at the shoulder girdle, shoulder is probably a place where you're going to see the odd injury in rugby based on impact uh, within the tackle. Um, so for the shoulder, if your flat biochrome, your press is 100 kilos. So a closer grip press, not a wide grip, mm -hmm. uh, is 100 kilos. You need your lower trap or your unilateral trap three and your external rotation to be 10% of that. It's actually 10.6 and 9.8, but we'll just make it 10% to make the maths easy. Um, so I would look at predictor lifts. So I would, I would test them and go, where's your bench press? Where's your front squat? Where's this? And then I could look at the balance between the joint. It's like swinging door theory. If your chest is too strong, all these muscles are internally rotating the shoulder. All of these muscles on the back are now going to be uh, lengthened and weak. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a case of stretching out here. It's a case of strengthening in this one. So I look at the, the first uh, thing for injuries is to look at the structural balance of the muscle. The other one is looking at the quality of movement within the gym. How many people do half our squats? A lot of them. <laughs> yeah, fuck everyone. So I'm talking full ask the grass, leave a stain on the floor. All of your, all of your weight lifting, there should be no ego in weight with weights or strength and conditioning when you're, when you're playing for a sport because all of your weight lifting is assistance for the actual sport. So I'd look for range and quality over the actual weight. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. So proper, proper squatting. Um, after that, um, I mean, you've got to look at where they're getting the most injuries. So Training your neck right. is probably something that isn't done enough, yep. is underrated, usually grip as well. But neck, the neck, training the neck in rugby is life insurance. Yeah, definitely. Um, with Pulled all the head the injuries positions, yeah. uh, that you get nowadays, you just have to get pulled straight off. So I actually have a neck machine on the end of my rack. You can just get a Swiss ball and lie against it. You can push against your hands. There's many ways of training the neck. Um, with regards to prehab, I'm not a big prehab sort of guy. I'm kind of use certain, ex use certain exercises, um, but I have a good history with injuries. I use a lot of modified strongman stuff to, keep, to get people um, uh, out of rehab and in. Rehab is really strength training if you look at it. Yeah, okay. I, don't to, I don't want to explain that. The same thing. It's basically strength training, but just tapered down a bit. Yeah, but you're just fucking, you're really fucking weak. So you have to come, you've got to get to that level. So, I mean, I, I work with a, with a therapist called Peter, or Dr. Peter Lundgren, and we had the same kind of ethos. He, he could take someone from a hospital bed all the way through, and so could I. But it, there needs to be a blend of you know, you know, getting people stronger with regards to rehabilitation, where the rehab, there's, there's only so much fucking a lot of band, resistance bands doing clams can, can do. You need to progress people into a, a actual lifting. So those are the kind of main areas. Training with an injury is dumb. You shouldn't be training an injury. You should look to fix the injury and move on. But for me, I'm always looking for the underlying cause of the injury. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if I, if I go back to what I've learned from Dr. Peter Lundgren, is that majority of injuries, if we take out all contact injuries, because that you know, shit happens if you get mashed up on the pitch, um, majority of injuries are due to inactive or inhibited muscle groups. Mm -hmm. So we go back to here, the, 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 the chest and the shoulders doing too much, and these ones are inhibited. You're getting shoulder injury because you're not working the small stabilizer muscles in the back. Yep. So I would always look to go, which muscle in that chain is not giving you um, uh, what it needs? It's, it's quite common, guys, if, if their shoulders are rounded or if they're only going to the gym a handful of times and they want to bench every time, they want to do a few rows, but there's nothing kind of upper back working. So, and they mm. wondered why their shoulders busted or popping out all the time. Yeah, for sure. You just look at, look at what they're doing in the gym and if it's just the most the, the same repetitive type stuff um then obviously as long as they go kind of change it up and working yeah. on the smaller muscles that maybe you can't see are the best thing for you <laughs> when the time you're in the gym it, it, you know what uh, i've heard people talk about that they, they, they train the the beach muscles yeah the shit you can see in the mirror not the stuff that you tr that you can't see so yeah i get it not good um and if uh if we're talking about what you're doing coaching wise i think you said just before we started this call um that you're yeah. doing mainly more more contact stuff and i sorry, more online stuff and this whole week you don't even go into the gym right i go into the gym to train i do the odd thing but ideally uh -huh. this is a deload week so i i use a mindset consult uh with a lot of my clients it takes a lot out of me 
Um, so what I tend to do is this week, no consults with clients. Mm -hmm. uh, you, sometimes you want, need the client to take a step away, even if you're doing nutritional consults, take a step away for a week and then come back to it. See what they've learned and, and how they've adapted on their own. Because my end goal is to empower people. I don't want to be, this is why I don't count calories for people because mm -hmm. you're just doing the homework for them. Here, eat this. No, fuck, you need to learn what to eat. So the, the, I take a step away this week. All of my clients or most of my clients uh, uh, are online. So I write the program. They send me videos throughout the week. I respond to, right, work on this, look at this, look at this. We have mm -hmm. a catch-up call once a week where we, we discuss anything we need to on the program. They'll send me their numbers on their programs. They fill in the weights uh, and reps that they, they completed. Then I can go, right, go to this way or push this. This is wrong. Push a little harder here. But I don't, I don't really work uh, uh, with clients anymore on the gym floor. I take a group session in the gym once in a while, once in a while just to shout at people. Mm -hmm. um, but nothing, nothing serious. I think I burnt myself out in the first five or six years of training people. Um, I think also once you get to a point where I don't consider myself a master, but I consider myself a decent level trainer where it's not challenging anymore. What, what is challenging to me is, is, uh, educating my coaches and getting them to be better. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't enjoy the actual one-on-one -on -one seeing somebody every day, slow progress. I don't mind seeing videos on, uh, from online coaches, but an hour with somebody, it's just not, not my idea of fun anymore. And then you said, and you said before, um, that you're doing a lot of mindset coaching and you're training a lot of other PTs. What's your split yeah. between training athletes and PTs for their business? Is it even or is it more one way? No, it's, it's not even. It's probably 25% uh, training PTs and, and doing consults for them. Mm -hmm. And then a mixture between strongman and general pop. It's mostly people who want to get stronger. Uh, so I have power lifters, strength athletes. I have the odd general pop athlete, a general population client as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so some people will, will, will be like, what the hell's online training? How does it work? You need someone to show you. Obviously, someone in your case who is very numbers based and focus, uh, numbers focused can tell them why they would go for online training. Um, what would you say for people that ask, like, how does it work? Or, or what, would they, what would be a part of their online training program with you? Well, what they receive with me is a completely personalized program. So I control every variable in the gym um, so that there's no, there's, no, there's no messing things up there. Uh, then they get a consult every week with me. So it's half an hour of my time up to uh, where we'll look at lifestyle, mindset if we need to, whatever comes up, whatever the weakest link is. Uh, is it for everyone? No. Um, I've, I've, got, I've had complete beginners all the way through to uh, I've helped Matthias Belsack who went to world strongest man finals. Um, and I've had Darren Wright world record holder in the deadlift. Um, so I've got seasoned athletes and completely complete newbies. It's just a case of they're all making the same mistakes when it comes down to it, but it's a case of just with the general pop, just being a bit more patient with them mm -hmm. using protocols are a lot easier for them to read at, at the start um, and progress them through slowly. But it, everyone's sending me videos and everyone, regardless of their level is getting feedback on their lift. Mm -hmm. and making mistakes but um it can be good to go and start with a personal trainer face to face and see if that works and then once you feel that you have the confidence to go in a gym by yourself and read a program and and and, and, and take that on then yeah move into online coaching is, is a more cost effective option anyway. yeah i think i think i think if you're a complete newbie and you don't know what a barbell or what, what everything is you need someone to teach you in person whether that's a class or a gym mm -hmm. instructor or a few in-person pt sessions um, but yeah, I wasn't going to ask about prices, but compared to in-person PT, online training is a lot cheaper on, on our end as well. Um, it's less time invested with them, so you can... <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if you know how to train and you don't need someone to go, well done, champ, good rep. Like, and if you just want to get on there and want someone who's an expert oh, to tell you what yeah. to do, that's, that's the best way to most, go. I'm lucky. I think most of the clients that come to me, uh, they either know about me so they know what I'm like, or they're also self-motivated. Mm-hmm. You either want it or you don't. Uh, I'm not there to kind of motivate you through. You either want to lose fat or you don't. You either want to get strong or you don't. You do the right things. I don't have to motivate anybody. I'm not a um, cheerleader or instruct or, uh, or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, with but mindset, motivation. it's a little bit different. It's helping ask the right questions and getting them to figure out what they need to do. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just, just kind of pointing them towards where they want to go, not giving them the answer, but just giving them a nudge.
Mm -hmm. And then just before that, you mentioned a few more newer guys in the strongman game, Matthias Belsak. Uh, what, why don't you show off with a few of the other names that you've had in your gym, a few of the world's strongest men? I've had, well, in the gym, I've had and I've interviewed uh, Big Z, Zadrunas. I made him, <laughs> he was doing, he came in to train log because he was quiet, he doesn't get pestered, and he, was, he liked the facility. So it, we, he wanted to train log and he was warming up. And I said, Can you do 181? He was like, Yeah. I was like, Why? <laughs> I was like, because then you get on my record board because you'll be one kilo heavier. <laughs> It'll be one kilo heavier. So he's like, okay, it's fine. Just put it on. So we did that. I've had Big Z and he's good. Uh, we've had Brian Shorin, real nice yeah. guy. Um, had a good chat with him. Real down to earth. Who else? We had Matthias, obviously. Uh, Bill, Bill Kazma. Yeah, that's all that Yeah, was. Bill Kazma four, four times. Has he won it four or three? Has three times, I think. Oh, he won it. He's won it three times. World's strongest man. Nice. Um, he was good. He's very entertaining. Oh, I think, he's, I think he's brilliant. He's so like charismatic and American. Yes. And... He's, yeah, you could, you could say he's very American. Um, who else we had? Yeah, they're, they're by far the... the that's the, on those thinking you know, of, yeah. That's what, eight, 11 World Strongest Man titles uh, between them. So it's quite impressive. Mm -hmm. that's yeah. impressive. All heavyweight, literally the strongest man in the world. Yeah, I mean, arguably Big Z is the strongest man ever that's what everyone says uh -huh. uh, Brian Shaw is more of he's, he, he wins championships he doesn't go for the big lifts although he's incredibly strong obviously he's not that uh, you know going max deadlift thing he, he'd rather win a comp than win a deadlift yeah I get you I've walked past a few of those giants at the expos and they just tower over everyone <laughs> I have the smallest office at work I call it my cupboard office <laughs> and I had to get I had to try and wheel a big desk chair in for Z to sit on and he, he literally took up half my office. It was brilliant. <laughs> oh, he, uh, he, he recently dropped a load of, a load of weight. Um, is that still, was he still competing after that? I haven't seen... Much. He will be competing, yeah. Uh -huh. according, to, according to all his posts, he's going to be doing the log championships that he's hosting. Oh, which in Lithuania. Is September, September 7th in Lithuania. So he's got, I don't know, another 18, 17 weeks. So he's got plenty of time to get back up to... I mean, he was 180 kilos when he came to see me. He, like he looked like a ball sometimes on TV. Just a He's giant massive. Ball, giant ball of muscle. Mm. Um, cool, wicked. Um, so you, you mentioned your website and a few articles. Uh, mm -hmm. where, where would someone get hold of you best? What's the website? And you got any, any other tips or social sure. media? The best, the best platform would be my website, which is Winning Performance. So it's www.winning hyphen performance.uk and then if you want to if you want if you've got questions if something wasn't clear if i if i went too quickly or if you have follow-up questions i need the content or if you want to know more about uh how strong men for rugby might be useful i'll write an article or you can fire questions over via the contact form on the website cool wicked so that's tom hibber guys if you wanted to get in touch with him um get on the website thanks for coming on tom mate and uh best of luck with the my pleasure and everything Thank you else. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <And laughs> Cheers, I'll, mate. I'll chat to you soon. Cheers, mate. Bye. Bye.